I talk a lot on this channel about the tension between conservation and development. It's kind of like this big overarching theme that cuts through all of my videos. That's why I talk about national parks a lot, because nowhere is this tension more pronounced than in national parks. Places we set aside for people to go and enjoy our natural resources, but which are tasked with preserving those same resources. The issues that arise out of that tension are complicated and have lots of nuance and require difficult decisions to be made, which is one of the reasons, again, why I love talking about them and why I think it's so important to tell these types of stories. Today, we're going to talk about that same tension, that same recurring theme, but we're going to cover it from a completely different angle. We are going to talk about the national park that is under a constant bomb threat. My name is Cameron. Welcome to National Park Diaries. This is a channel, if you couldn't tell from the intro, where I tell educational, informative stories about parks, public lands, and protected areas from around the world, all in service of helping you understand some of the most pressing issues they are facing, and maybe, in some small way, helping to protect them for future generations to come. If you are interested in that type of content, then you should consider subscribing to the channel and hitting the little bell thing so you don't miss an episode. If you'd like to support me more directly, I do have a Patreon where you can get up to three extra videos per month, plus access to my Discord, as well as some other assorted benefits. This channel is entirely fan funded and I quite literally couldn't make these videos without your support, so thank you. All right, on with the story. Today, we're talking about White Sands National Park, which up until recently, 2019, was known as White Sands National Monument. Encompassing some 146,000 acres, it protects the largest gypsum dune field in the world and has been attracting visitors for over a century. Now, this park, for the early part of its history, was pretty unremarkable when it came to the problems and challenges it faced. There was this constant tension between development of the park's resources for the public and preserving those same resources in their natural state. I mean, this is like the universal problem for all national parks. Like I said in the intro, it's literally written into the legislation creating the National Park Service in the first place. So in its early days, the park struggled with things like how to deal with increasing visitation, lack of financial resources, lack of institutional support, and being in an arid environment like the Tularosa Basin meant that finding a supply of fresh water was an issue as well. Again, these are pretty standard issues for national parks across the board. Not to say they aren't important or that those problems don't require solutions, just that White Sands wasn't alone in having those sorts of challenges. That would all change, though, when it acquired the United States military as a neighbor. Even then, its journey as a typical park with typical problems didn't even last that long. The park was actually first established in 1933 by Herbert Hoover, who used his authority under the Antiquities Act, we've talked about that here on the channel before, to proclaim it as White Sands National Monument, which it remained until, again, 2019, when it was redesignated as a national park. Like many parks, it had a few years of New Deal activity, but as soon as the US entered World War II, it acquired a whole new set of challenges. So basically for less than a decade, it had its day in the sun as a normal park with normal park problems. But for the last nearly 80 years, White Sands has faced an almost impossible set of challenges, some of which have threatened the very viability of the park itself. Let me show you what I'm talking about. White Sands National Park is surrounded on three sides by the White Sands Missile Range and on one side by Holloman Air Force Base. So military property on all sides. It's a little island of natural resource preservation and public access in a sea of some of the most heavily guarded, tightly restricted land in the country. Now, it's not unusual for national parks to be surrounded by other federal lands. Yellowstone, for instance, is completely surrounded by national forest land, but despite that, their management approaches are generally compatible. It's a matter of degree, but the Park Service and the Forest Service are basically going to be managing their respective lands for conservation, and so Yellowstone can rest easy knowing that even outside its boundaries, the ecosystem it's part of will remain intact. At White Sands, they don't have that luxury. 
The military has a completely different land use priority than the preservation mindset espoused by the Park Service. I mean, literally, they test bombs here, literal missiles. It's called the White Sands Missile Range. Hell, this is the place where they detonated the first ever nuclear bomb in human history. The Trinity site is located just 60 miles north of the White Sands Park boundary within the White Sands Missile Range. This is not exactly conducive to a healthy park ecosystem, and it certainly doesn't make preservation of that ecosystem any easier. In fact, at times, it's been almost impossible. Let me share a few examples with you. In 1948, desk-sized missile debris landed just a quarter mile away from the compound where White Sands employees lived. In 1954, a man had his arm ripped off by a low-flying plane when he stopped to take a rest in the dunes during a hike. Later that same year, an errant missile exploded in the park's picnic area, destroying a shelter and some tables and benches. No one was hurt or killed in this incident, thankfully. That same year still, a warhead from another errant missile landed outside the visitor center, and the military had to deploy this like commando squad with helicopters and trucks and soldiers to come and recover it as quickly as possible. I'm just picturing that clothing removal squad from Monsters, Inc. <laughs> In 1959, a rocket landed in the dunes that was said to contain classified information and had to be immediately disposed of on the spot. They detonated it with 500 pounds of TNT, and it left a blast crater 18 feet deep and 300 feet wide. And that was all within the first 15 years of the military's presence. The 1960s would see the worst of it as the United States ramped up its involvement in Vietnam and the full weight of the military-industrial complex came to bear on White Sands. The relationship between the park and the military had deteriorated pretty significantly by this point. Back in 1947, they had signed a joint-use memorandum of understanding granting the military access to certain areas of the monument for testing and training and things like that, but it was less a joint use agreement and more of a military does what it likes agreement. Over the years, they would construct all sorts of infrastructure in the area without Park Service permission, destroy the fragile ecosystems of the dunes and the salt flats, and even restrict NPS personnel from entering the area completely. By 1957, this joint use area encompassed some 40% of the park, and in 1963, the military even proposed increasing that to 70%. This joint use area is still in place today. There were other concerns throughout the years as well, not just missiles. There was talk of a spaceport being constructed in the salt flats at one point. Planes, sometimes supersonic ones, would fly over at low altitudes, sometimes up to 500 times a day which disturbed the park's wildlife and soundscapes, yes, but also did physical damage to the adobe structures of the park's visitor center area. They practiced tank and truck driving maneuvers on the dunes to prepare for desert warfare, and in 1963, trash dumps were found all throughout the dunes as well, left over from military activity. Also, park closures were a regular occurrence, sometimes with little to no notice, making it hard for the park to fulfill its mission of providing public access to the dunes. There were also impacts that were less physically damaging to park resources, but still impacted park operations. For example, we've already talked about the difficulty the park had finding an adequate water source in an arid area, but that difficulty was exacerbated with the military's presence in the area because they needed water too. Also, the massive buildup of military installations around the park attracted lots of military families which needed places to live, which meant open spaces were converted into housing, which of course impacted the desert ecosystem of which the park was a part. These families then needed recreation areas, and White Sands was the obvious option. Not a bad thing by any means, national parks are there for people to enjoy. It's just another thing, another unexpected consequence of having the world's most powerful military as your neighbor. Now, the historical context is important here in understanding why the Park Service didn't have a lot of power to push back on the one-sided arrangement. Remember that this is the height of the Cold War, and national security is at the forefront of pretty much every decision being made by the US government at this time. 
and PS didn't raise too much of a stink over at White Sands for fear of appearing to impede national security and economic development. They were low on the totem pole, and they simply didn't have standing here, and White Sands found it quite difficult to enact its mission at this time. In fact, this power dynamic was so absolute, so one-sided, that one superintendent of White Sands was even worried that if they pushed back too much, that the monument might be abolished altogether, just completely subsumed into the larger military complex surrounding it. Obviously, that did not happen, the park still exists today, but it doesn't mean the park doesn't still have challenges with the military today. They still deal with errant debris from missiles, they still receive those flyovers, they still have park closures for missile testing, they still have toxic materials stored on the missile range adjacent to their borders. These are significant challenges, and truly unique to any national park, and still make it difficult to carry out the sort of preservation activities that the Park Service is tasked with overseeing. I think it's also worth mentioning here too that by all accounts, the relationship between the military and the park has improved since those Cold War days. For one, missile tests are usually announced well in advance, usually two weeks. In fact, three days after this video goes live, the park will be closed for two hours, 7 a.m. to 9 a.m. Thursday and Friday for missile testing. They've renegotiated that joint use agreement and the Park Service is on a much more equal footing in that area now. And in a baby steps kind of way, I guess, less missiles do end up in the park now than they used to. And I bring all this up to, again, just bring your attention to the unique circumstances that have shaped White Sands National Park throughout its history. We're used to having national parks with development challenges. Because of the dual mandate, we're used to there being a tension when it comes to protecting natural resources. It's just usually that tension exists between the parks and the people coming to visit them as they balance protecting natural resources with public access. White Sands still has this, but then there's this whole other tension that comes with being surrounded on all sides by literal bombs by the world's most powerful military. There's an added preservation challenge here totally unique to White Sands that really exacerbates the whole development conservation dichotomy. I think it's a testament to the resiliency of this park actually, and to the people who have run it over the years that it's adapted and changed and survived the challenges that have been thrown at its way for most of its history, while still providing a core national park experience. But if we could stop bombing our national parks, that would be great. Okay, thanks for watching. I'd love to know what you think of this whole super unique situation that White Sands has going on. Have you ever been there when it's closed for missile testing? What are your thoughts on this relationship? This is a really complicated and interesting arrangement that's not going away anytime soon, and I'd love to hear what you have to say, so feel free to let me know down in the comments. Don't forget to subscribe and hit the little bell thing so you don't miss an episode. Uh, follow me on Instagram and check out my Patreon. Thanks for watching. Goodbye.